little summary of what WebAssembly is. This talk is not designed to teach you all about the details of WebAssembly. Instead, we're going to talk about how you can use WebAssembly on server-side applications. But we do want to summarize to make sure we bring along as many people as possible with us along for the journey. So WebAssembly is a little bit like some things that people have tried before. Strike, stop me if this sounds familiar. You can write your apps once and run them anywhere. Of course you've heard that, Java, Silverlight, Flash, this promise has been made many times, but this time it's different. With WebAssembly, we have an open WC3 standard that's already supported on the devices you already use and love, all of your major browser vendors. Uh, it's incredibly efficient and fast, and it's polygot. Like, it's not like Java, it doesn't come with its own programming language. It allows you to take code that you have and then recompile it down to this intermediate format. It runs everywhere. And what's powerful about WebAssembly is, is that these little engines, uh, these WASM runtimes can be tuned for different circumstances. So for example, you might wanna have your code running on big silicon in the cloud and you can have a WebAssembly runtime like WASM time that's tuned for that. Or perhaps you want to do some uh, just-in-time compiling or ahead-of-time compiling out on the edge, and you want to use a, um, a runtime that's tuned for low power or low memory. Um, you can still use the same code and port them to both. So this is a very portable technology. And one of the most powerful things that we will talk about is that it's a very safe technology. But I'm going to hold that value prop for a moment. Let's talk about what we mean when we say cloud native. You know, when we talk about cloud native, we're really talking about this third epic in the last 25 or so odd years of computing, where uh, 20 years ago, uh, even longer than that at this point, 25 years ago, people started to realize when they were building data centers that there was an opportunity to be more efficient. And uh, virtualization came out, and that really was accelerated with the public cloud. And the key move that happened there is, is that the security boundary moved from the box itself, you know, the, the Dell server, the IBM server, up to the CPU. And there were a lot of crazy implications in that. And then a few years later, we sort of entered the epic that we're in now with containers. And people said, God, you know, I used to build these images and it would have, you know, RAID controller firmware in it. And that was crazy. And why am I doing this with my uh, uh, software applications, shipping entire operating systems. So a virtualization layer, uh, uh, you know, containers was uh, put together and coupled with Kubernetes, it's really come to dominate the landscape. But we're gonna talk a little bit about how the technology we, technology we have today does not meet the challenges that we have today. And we're gonna do that by looking at the modern computing environment. This a uh, picture of the world is really what is going to drive the next 20 years of change. And we say that, and I think that, because um, containers uh, will work on much of this infrastructure. When you think on the far left side of this image, we have the central public cloud, and on the far right, we have the tiniest devices in your lives, tiny watches, refrigerators, things like that. There is a continuum where Kubernetes will work great. It will continue to go out to the edge and containers can be brought there. But there are an increasing number of cases that do not depend on Linux, nor will run Kubernetes. And an easy one I'd point out is your web browser, which is probably one of the most common ways that you inter interact with software today. Never mind all of these tiny devices, lower power and memory constrained devices. These, are, are not, these will not work and there is some lower bound where we can take today's technology. So what are the problems, what are the additional problems that we have with today's technology? Uh, yesterday, we hosted the second uh, Cloud Native WebAssembly Day, and uh, my good friend uh, Ralph Squatchy, and I spelled his name wrong there, sorry, Ralph, uh, actually quipped that in the new, there is no edge in the new cloud. And I think he's absolutely right. I just had this article posted in uh, the Newstack last Monday, uh, but there are all these compelling reasons when, if you want to sit and have the discussion on where will compute live in the future? You know, will it all just live centrally on the far left side of that diagram in the public cloud and everything on the far right is dumb and just makes API calls? And I would argue absolutely not for at least these five reasons. There are latency and determinant, uh, deterministic reasons why you need to make decisions locally. Think like your Tesla, you want real time. Uh, there are privacy and security reasons why you would not want to ship personal data out of a particular environment. There are times when you want liber uh, you know, limited or deliberate autonomy. Think like drones or things that go offline. Think of my refrigerator. If it's disconnected from the public cloud, it better still keep uh, things cool. 
Uh, oftentimes on the edge is where the data is. Think of your Nest doorbell. It doesn't ship all of that uh, data back uh, to the central cloud. It does pre-processing first to select key images that have faces and other things and then ships them back. Uh, and regulatory reasons, you know, GDPR, CCPA, regula regulation is an invest move right now. We're going to have far more regulation in the near future than we've ever had in our industry in the past. And if we accept that the future of applications is distributed, then we also accept that there are some significant problems that we're going to have to deal with. And we're going to talk about these a little bit. But the first one is a diverse set of system architectures. The second one is, is that the application architectures themselves will be different. How many times are you using peer-to-peer -peer technologies, for example, device-to-device, -device, that don't even transit the public cloud? System security, how do, we, how do we reuse this code and deploy it everywhere and keep it safe? Um, uh, offline use and machine learning. Uh, there's a link to the article in the new stack if you'd like to read a couple page paper about or article about um, uh, the further reasons there. But let's walk through the three key challenges in today's computing environment that are driving the rise of WebAssembly. The first is uh, portability. This diverse execution environments that we need to be able to run in, places where we have different CPUs, different operating systems, or even neither of those, like the browser, where we just sort of have an execution environment. The second big reason is security. Across that new continuum of technology, how are we going to secure this and lock this down? Containers are scoped to a Linux process. How do we take a security model that's scoped to a Linux process to places where we don't even have Linux, or processes for that matter? And the third big reason is the one we're going to spend the most uh, time on, because I think that this is the opportunity for the biggest innovation in technology, period especially when coupled with WebAssembly. And it's the tight coupling that we currently make between applications and their libraries or capabilities that they use. We'll tease that apart in a moment. Let's go through these one at a time. So this first challenge is portability. We are on the way to 50 billion internet connected devices by 2030. That is a phenomenal number. And collectively, this represents as much, if not more, computational power than we have in the cloud itself. If this is the new cloud, then we have a whole new set of challenges here. But what I would emphasize is, is that, yes, there's a story around ARM and PowerPC and MIPS and all of the long tail of risk chips that you find out in today's ecosystem, but this is also a problem in data centers. Think of the AMD Graviton 64-bit ARM processors that they've launched. When we build containers today, we make an implicit assumption and we target a specific CPU architecture. So another case where containers don't fail, and if you suddenly have to support dozens or hundreds of different um, architectures, having an intermediate format like WebAssembly is a huge win. So for this first big challenge, I think it's clear WebAssembly brings a lot to the table, and it's something that can be considered. Let's go to the second big challenge. What about the security of these things? Now, this idea of capability-driven security is not new. Any of the Linux networking uh, uh, you know, geeks in the audience have probably used you know, sudo setcat before to give privileges to Snort or Shurikata or Bro or something to monitor a network interface. But it's the idea that the children no longer inherit the permissions of the parents. And WebAssembly really embraces this capability-driven permissions in that if you want to access a file or a folder, then you have to be specifically granted to it. WebAssembly is denied by default. And you're becoming increasingly familiar with this. Think five or 10 years ago when you installed an application on your phone, it just installed. Today, it actually prompts you on a line-by-line -line basis for access to the video camera, to the microphone, and the other capabilities. That same model is coming to our cloud software. And then we're going to extend that. So for this second big problem, I think WebAssembly is another great fit. It brings us a more, it brings us a more portable, more granular security model that runs everywhere. That feels like a win-win. It runs at near native speed. So let's carry this forward a little bit. What about this third problem? You know, in, um, in French, there's this wonderful word, Elan, and it's, to translate it directly, I think it means something like momentum, but it's so much more than that. It's that moment right when the bird has got its wings flapped and it's about to take flight, or when the dancer is spinning its, her leg faster and faster and faster and picking up momentum, right? That's the Elan. And what, what really, um, I think, is a big opportunity to ride this WebAssembly excitement is to consider this tight coupling here 
because this tight coupling that we have acts as an anchor that holds us in place. If you're building for a specific cloud provider and you're using specific cloud provider services, who cares how portable your code is if you're stuck in that particular location? So we've seen this rise of actor models in technologies like Wasm Cloud and in technologies like Dapper, where instead of binding to specific libraries, you bind to a contract. And on the other side of that contract, just like a Lego block, you can plug in different capabilities. So these are the capabilities that you would use to satisfy all sorts of things in your app. If you're building um, uh, an application to calculate loan interest, or you're building some social media scoring, or you know any kind of uh, business logic that you want to put into it, you have to typically couple that with a large amount of non-functional requirements. In the enterprise, that's gets extreme, and you have to start coupling it with security and logging uh, and other sorts of uh, tools. And the dirty secret of enterprise application development, especially on the server side, is, is that the vast majority of the application uh, code base is someone else's code. It is nearly criminal that in today, modern cloud native app development, you start each new application with 20,000 lines of someone else's code. And there are some devastating impacts to that. The private studies that I've seen in some enterprises was even higher, as, many as, as much as 99% of their template, some Java Spring Boot application was non-functional requirements that they were managing. And those non-functional requirements act as a weight that holds you in place there. Now, across this microservice lifecycle, when you accept all of those non-functional requirements, you end up with some pretty devastating impacts. The first is, is that you have an inability to move things from design quickly out of POC into production because there's completely different assumptions that are made that are non-functional. The second is, is that building your app means that you have a lot of boilerplate code that you have to manage and run. Uh, deploying this, um, having to build pipelines for each different CPU architecture or each different device becomes a long tail of non-functional requirements that you would just select. I need one set of security primitives for uh, Android, another for iOS, yet another for my edge devices, and yet another for my core cloud uh, uh, functioning. And the last uh, is by far the most devastating. And if you've worked at an enterprise, you're constantly hounded by these high, medium, low vulnerabilities in that 20,000 lines of code that you need to patch and maintain. And all of that holds you back from your core purpose of building and deploying business logic. So this tight coupling that we see at the top layer really becomes one of the biggest challenges that we're facing in modern cloud native development. And with WebAssembly today and its adoption to meet the first two challenges, there comes a huge opportunity as well to solve for the third. So um, I'm one of the co-creators of an open source CNCF framework that's called Wasm Cloud. Uh, and it's both compatible with, but not dependent upon the current cloud native stack. And we're gonna look at a couple demonstrations of running things all together while also running for the edge. And as I mentioned before, this is not the only approach. There's Microsoft has put out a wonderful application layer, uh, a tool that is uh, directly aligned to cloud native. It's a sort of depends on containers in the ecosystem. So it would meet the first left half of the cloud native world, but doesn't uh, um, solve uh, for the uh, far right half here. So in both of these models, you essentially start to adopt this contract driven approach. Instead of importing all of this non-functional code, you simply import a small contract. And the goal of Wasm Cloud is to sort of flip those numbers on their head and make your applications 95% business logic and only 5% non-functional code. Because on the other side of these Lego blocks, these uh, contracts, you can hot swap at runtime into different uh, um, actual requirements there. Uh, so. Uh, now, this isn't even a new idea. Um, it's a little different to start thinking from the top down, to start at the business logic and work your way down. But to me, this is the next obvious step in um, the continued epics of technology. And when you think about the landscape today, we already have layers uh, that are doing this for us just in a different domain. For example, on top of Kubernetes, we could layer Istio. And Istio would just remove some of the network-related concerns, such as traffic routing and role-based access control. And on top of that, we could even use Dapper, which will give us this application layer uh, concerns like the key value store. 
But Wasm Cloud takes it even further and really turns your business logic into these composable actors. It's more of a shift, and we couple it with both Elixir on the back end uh, for extreme scale and for uh, and with NATs, uh, uh, so you get a networking layer on the front end. So let's slide into our first demo. Now. This is an incredible demo that completely surprised me. It came out of nowhere. And I'm only going to give you the summary of this one because the full talk is definitely worth your time. This was uh, showed at Wasm Cloud, I'm sorry, at a, a Wasm Day, Cloud Native Wasm Day yesterday. Uh, and uh, this was a, a, a group called Red Badger, and they did this on behalf of a large financial service. And to help set the stage a little bit, uh, this organization um, had a number of service interruptions with some of the public cloud outages over the last year. And they have uh, their regular asking them when can they go multi-cloud. So uh, what they do in the demo, the source code is linked right here. If you want to go ahead and grab a quick uh, link, you can spin this up yourself, but I'll set up the scene a little bit further. Uh, in this demo, what we're going to have is we're going to have uh, the same compiled code deployed to two uh, uh, different clouds, in this case, AWS and GCP. And you can see that we have a set of steps here in a, this basic microservice that implements the to-do spec, uh, you know, common reference application that people will implement in a language for fun uh, and example. And uh, what we're going to do as we kind of walk into this is um, we're going to start failing over live from one cloud to another uh, as we delete parts of the application. We'll just go a little chaos monkey on it. Now, logically, what's happening here is this view of the world, in which case you have uh, GCP on the left and you have uh, AWS on the right. And uh, the NATS, uh, the CNCF NATS project gives us a sort of application layer view that seamlessly connects these two environments. So it does the auto discovery and it does partitioning. We'll talk a little bit about NATS in a moment. And we'll start by just running things in the happy path. We'll tr send, we'll curl, send a curl request into, into GCP. Uh, and they'll be resolved. And then we'll send curl request into AWS, uh, and they'll be resolved. And then we're going to um, uh, start deleting components, and we'll watch the application still function normally uh, without any changes whatsoever to the code. And it happens because of that crisp separation between those two layers there. Uh, then we'll restore the happy path, and, uh, and things will work here. So I'm going to kind of watch for time on this. And hilarious. I can't see your screen. So let me just. OK. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Perfect dish. Um, let me skip ahead here a little bit. Um, this is the talk uh, that we'll see tomorrow here. Uh, and uh, this is the little bit of setup that we're doing. And then we're going to get to, um, on the left here, uh, we've got um, a logically a set of windows, just terminals set up just like in the pictures. Uh, so on the left, we've got a gcp.wasmcloud.demo. Uh, and on the right, we've got AWS. Uh, and as we start sending um, our simple curl commands in here, uh, we'll see that the application functions normally um, and delivers our code on both happy paths here. And as we move into this demo, um, uh, we're going to start to see um, uh, us delete the pods down here at the bottom, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, and the GCP path is now unhappy. It doesn't have all the components in the microservice to complete it. Uh, but the sort of uh, the technology here is going to auto fail uh, right over to um, AWS. And as we watch uh, the request come in here, uh, this really is a very interesting demo. So I kind of wanted to summarize this one for you and encourage you to watch this when it hits YouTube in two weeks, 13 days from today. Uh, uh, we'll tweet this out off of our accounts. Uh, but um, this is a great demo, and all the code is linked right off uh, the previous link there as well. It's um, on Red Badger's um, uh, site there, uh, and I really encourage you guys to check that one out. Um, so let's explain a little bit about what's happening under the, under the covers here. Um, the CNCF NATS essentially gives us uh, the ability to create these uh, super, super nodes and leaf clusters here. Uh, so um, uh, in, when you can satisfy a request locally, these requests are being routed locally. 
And in that previous demo, we were running on Kubernetes, by the way. I forgot to mention that detail. My apologies. So we were running on two different Kubernetes distributions in the previous demo. But at the application layer, we now have the ability to do this auto discovery and resolution outside of our local leaf nodes if we can't meet our, make our constraints there. What it means to you as a developer is, is that you no longer have to think about clouds. You no longer have to think about topology. In fact, your business logic uh, uh, is completely separated from your topology and your topology can change at runtime. We're gonna demonstrate that in a live demo we do in just a second here. Uh, so in this next demo, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do something similar to that, except we're going to deploy running code to people in the audience. Uh, so uh, Taylor, uh, are you connected to the Wi-Fi? Uh, so Taylor up here um, is, uh, is running um, uh, Wasm Cloud as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate that same ability to fail over here. Okay. So... All right, so this is uh, my local computer here, and I'll just explain the dashboard a little bit. And there's all, of course, works via API uh, and um, uh, through a command line CLI called WASH. Uh, everything in the WebAssembly world is some sort of a WA joke. You know, uh, it's this is the WASH board. Uh, there's WASH. There's uh, all sorts of uh, WA jokes that are out there. And uh, we're essentially running the Java uh, pet store. Has anybody ever written the Java pet store before? No one? All right, this is like a, when you get into Java programming, this will be one of the sort of demos that the books always use. Uh, it starts simple and basic, and it gets increasingly and increasingly complex here. Uh, and logically, what we have here is, is an API that's fronting three other different uh, actors that are here. Now, these actors have capabilities. They have Lego blocks on the bottom. And what's great is, is that you can plug them into Lego blocks anywhere. So locally, they're plugged into an HTTP web server and into a Postgres database. Uh, and that's what's happening here with these link definitions. Um, now, I can also see that there are some other hosts here uh, that are sitting uh, on, the, on the network. And uh, Taylor, what is your ID? Are you NA6LA or NBVVU? Uh, you, not you. All right. Uh, all right, uh, Steve, uh, one of our coworkers, is also connected. So this is Taylor's laptop here. Now, Taylor, do you have control of the CNCF network? No. Have you forwarded any ports or networking or anything like that? Nothing but NAT. Okay, so he said that there's nothing but um, uh, Wasm Cloud running NATs uh, on his computer. You can see that Taylor isn't uh, isn't run anything. So let's go ahead and start uh, part of the application here on Taylor's computer, and we'll go ahead and start. Uh, Vets, uh, which is a piece of this app. And I'm just gonna go and kick that off and I'll give you a demo of what this app actually looks like um, if you're not familiar with it. So this is a simple web scaffolding that we've thrown on top of it. But there are a couple simple routes here. We've got a uh, pets, so we've got uh, Charlie Brown who has a dog Snoopy. And uh, Snoopy is uh, completely paranoid uh, and having hallucinations, especially around Halloween. So we'll put that on here. And he's going to see a Diana Edwards for his, his vet. And I can uh, click close here. And um, you can see that the, um, uh, that the oh, I'm sorry, I hit close instead of add visit. That was my bad. I'll just spell hallucinations wrong. First, Diana Edwards, add visit. There we go. All right, so we can see Snoopy has been to the vet. Now, what's really powerful here is, is that this is all part of this somewhat um, amorphous mesh now. So you can see Taylor's running a part of the Vets app. And if I come back to uh, my computer right here, you can see that I'm running it all as well. And we can, it, you know, beyond using the UI, we could also, uh, you know, curl this. You guys probably can't see that very well. If you could let me in the back know when the text is big enough. Great. Thank you so much. Great. So I can just uh, curl. And I can see that I could hit that API. Now, what would happen if we, um, you know, delete this? And this is the, uh, you know, the um, the live demo, right? So let's see what happens when we delete it. So I'm no longer running that piece of this application here locally. And let's see. Fingers crossed. I really want to scream goal, but I'm mic'd up. Sorry. To me, that's really exciting. 
Think about what we just demonstrated there simply. We have two completely disconnected clouds. There's no VPN between our, uh, between our devices here, right? I could be running on Kubernetes or not. I could be on the edge or not. I couldn't even define the edge, to be honest with you, right? There is no definition of that, of that term anymore because there is no real definition of cloud anymore because all of the old boundaries have simply fallen to the wayside. Oh, and we could be running on different CPUs or on different operating systems. And we both are running and compiling the same code in WebAssembly. As a developer, I love this because what I don't have to worry about is everything else. It's simply resolved in the tower of turtles that live below me. And trust me, in modern cloud development, Yertle's got nothing on these turtles, right? All the way down, whatever your organization's opinionated choices are, you need to run Istio, you need to run Envoy, however quickly they change. All of that simply gets pushed to the layer below us now. And up here at the, developing, at the developer layer, we're free to just build our applications and run them. Now there's a team that will be below us that will run those platforms. Uh, however, they now can stay in their own swim lane and stay out of ours. This is a huge um, uh, opportunity in, um, in cloud uh, native computing. And what I would want to emphasize is, is that uh, there are multiple approaches to this. You know, I'm demonstrating in uh, Wasm Cloud today because that's the technology that I work on, uh, but Dapper's also moving in this direction as well. Now, they haven't adopted uh, WebAssembly, so that wouldn't make a great talk about cloud native applications with WebAssembly, except not with WebAssembly. Uh, but um, this is, I think, a huge piece of what the excitement is around with WebAssembly. So with our last couple of minutes here, let's talk about some of the things that are working together to make this happen. So Wasm Cloud is a CNCF project. Uh, we started it about two years ago. Uh, uh, and it is a stack of components that give you the ability to um, uh, develop very simply. And down at the bottom layer, it starts with WebAssembly, which I like to think of as just a virtual CPU. You know, when, you're, when you compile your code to WebAssembly, there's no virtual operating system here. Now, there are some operating system-like constructs on the way called WASI. And when those come along, you'll sort of have the ability to uh, you know, open sockets and uh, do some of those other things. But right now, this is just simply like a box that you're locked into. And uh, what Wasm Cloud does is it comes along and it brings a framework for your applications, an application framework that gives you um, a box of Legos and takes care of a lot of the hard underlying tasks. For example, when you want to move data out of your box, out of WebAssembly into the guest operating system and back, it does all that translation for you, even with complex data types. Uh, so it's designed for extreme scalability, uh, both horizontally uh, and vertically. As you just saw right now, I could spun up, I could have scaled my actors locally to you know, 100 actors, or I could scale horizontally. Uh, out and out and across. And uh, we leverage uh, this built-in networking layer called NATS, uh, also open source, in order to get that done. So this is extremely uh, scalable and composable. Uh, and of course, signed, it also inherits the capability-driven model uh, that uh, WebAssembly starts with. Now, on top of that, we centrally maintain a library of hot swappable capabilities. Those are those Lego blocks like web servers and database uh, uh, you know, driver type things like SQL servers, uh, message queues. Uh, but these capabilities are very easy to add. Uh, and we have a new developer experience with Wasm Cloud 5.0, which we just launched last week, that give you wizards in order to scaffold these things out and get them um, built out. On top of that, you start running your actors like the pet store. Uh, and then you plug in whatever Lego blocks you want. These are stateless and reactive, and they're incredibly tiny. Uh, and on the back end, Wasm Cloud uses Elixir, which is the same powerful technology that's been developed over the last 20 years to implement things like uh, WhatsApp initially and Discord. It's incredibly scalable uh, and powerful. And then we combine this uh, with NATS, which is the magic layer that just enabled that seamless connection between these two leaf nodes here. When the VETS app could satisfy its request locally here, just like we did in the AWS GCP demo, it did so. But when it couldn't, 
it um, uh, bid the contract out over to Taylor's computer and then pulled it back. And NATS is incredibly amazing um, for CNCF projects. It's self-healing, it's self-forming, there's no service discovery, and we just adopted a new technology called Jetstream that sort of gives you a local cache of what's on the network um, that, that works there. Now, when we even, I just want to mention that when we think about what this topology and what this technology enables, it's going to enable some pretty crazy things. Just as I was able to seamlessly offload part of my microservice and make topology detail with Taylor here, you can do that across clouds as well. There's no reason that you can't have part of your application running in one cloud and part of your application running in another cloud or on the edge itself. If you'd like more information about our most recent demo, we just launched uh, uh, 0 0.50 last week. Uh, there's live videos, training, uh, and for more information um, about what we're doing uh, with the stack and our view of the world, uh, you can come visit us at wasmcloud.com. Uh, this is the sort of summary view, though, of where I think we're going for the next epic of technology. Um, and when we look at this worldview, it really involves this crisp layer here in separation between um, your applications and what sits underneath them, your business logic and everything else. And uh, it really starts to meet the sort of needs that we have today around tiny, composable, uh, portable uh, business logic that we can take with us anywhere in a way that the current epic of technology just doesn't. So when we think cloud native, I just want to remind you that you know, WebAssembly is neither you know, web nor assembly, but cloud native is really kind of getting undefinable as well uh, as those boundaries kind of fall away on the edge. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. My name is Liam Randall, uh, wasmcloud.com, and then uh, for more information about uh, our company, it's cosmonic.com. Thank you.